Hi Leslie, my Hello. name is Katie and I'm the events manager at Try Yoga and we're really excited to be welcoming you to Try Yoga for the first time next mm -hmm. June. Mm -hmm. And what can students expect um, if they come to a workshop with you? Oh well, um, that's a good question <laughs> because I actually never know in advance exactly uh, what I'm going to teach because uh, the the way that I teach is very much based on the interaction that I have with the people that are in the room. Um, uh, for a lot of these events, uh, the majority of people are other yoga teachers, um, and so that always provides a certain basis for, for interacting uh, and a certain sort of common interest in the things that I teach. Um, but uh, it, it really uh, depends who shows up. Uh, but what everyone gets is a combination of um, uh, lecture, demo, practice, uh, focusing on the topics at hand, which are, are generally some anatomically informed inquiries into uh, what makes yoga yoga. Or more specifically, what would make an asana practice a yoga practice? So that, that's usually uh, sort of an underlying question um, that, um, that a lot of the topics uh, would, would be embracing. And you focus a lot on the breath. Um, within these workshops as well. Is that sort of a separate entity to the anatomy? Are they two separate topics or will you bring them all together? No, I think all the topics are together. I, I, yoga, anatomy, breathing, they're, they're really just all the same topic viewed from, from different perspectives. Uh, and, and so uh, the focus on, on the breathing for me really uh, is what unites so many of these different areas of interest that I have. Um, and uh, for example, you know, when you look at anatomy, if you just pick up any anatomy book, the, the, the level of detail that you're being exposed to is just overwhelming. You know, and I still get that feeling when I pick up a book, even if it's my book, it's like, <gasps> there's just a lot in here. And, and uh, I'm very easily confused by a lot of detail. So um, in order to not be confused, what I've had to do over the years is, is find a, a, a way of focusing on what details are most important. You know, it's almost like having a lens that you can look through. And when you're looking through that lens, what jumps out at you are the details that are most important for someone that is as interested as I am in uh, human movement and uh, yoga and, um, and, and breathing. And uh, breath is, for example, one of those lenses. You know, uh, so when you're looking at the, the human body, the human anatomy, all the details of anatomy through the lens of breathing, it's like, oh, well, okay, I guess the diaphragm is very important. So then you begin looking at the diaphragm and where is it attached and what is it in relation to and how does it move and um, you know uh, from having looked at all of those details I've actually uh, found a lot of misconceptions about breathing and about the diaphragm and to go back to your first question one of the things people can expect in the workshop is to hopefully experience a, a balance between what I call the aha moments which are like the light bulbs going off it's like Oh, right, this thing I've just learned explains this or that, it sort of and it integrates some of the things that, that you maybe have, have thought of that haven't tied together. So those, those are the aha moments. But then there's like the uh oh moments, <laughs> where you'll hear something that challenges something that you thought you knew or you thought was true. And when we talk about breathing, we actually have a fair number of uh oh moments, because there's a lot of misconceptions about breathing that get taught in in yoga classes and just in sort of the, the breath education world in general. So. Yeah, I mean, breathing is something we just do naturally. Thank goodness. Us, so we don't yeah. even think about it. Thank goodness um, it does that for <laughs> us, yes. Yeah. But what if, if you're just someone watching this video and maybe a tip on how you can breathe better, why it's important to breathe better, some of mm. the misconceptions around breath? Sure. Well, I think it doesn't occur to most people that there are better ways to breathe until they experience some sort of challenge they may be having with their breath. Um, because as you said, for the most part, we are capable of taking it for granted and it's just there for us. You know, uh, And that's a great thing about the way we humans breathe. We have this autonomic uh, functioning of the breath that just carries on all on its own without us needing to tend to it. Um, but there is this other ability we have to take some conscious voluntary control over our breathing. And, and that's what you do the minute you enter into a yoga class and someone asks you to move and breathe your body at the same time. And, and the details of how to get that accomplished become very interesting. 
um, because it's not something that people automatically know how to do right away, is to, to do a long, slow movement of the body and connect it with a long, slow movement of the breath. Um, we immediately start experiencing like what gets in the way of that, you know? Uh, and uh, what I always say is that, that a, a really good reason to learn a new way to breathe is because it confronts you with your old way of breathing. You know, it forces you to recognize that you have habits, that you have um, places where you get stuck. So in order to accomplish this new way of breathing, you have to unlearn your old way of breathing to a certain extent. Um, and you, you, you mentioned like what is a simple uh, little exercise that, that mm -hmm. people could do. Um, well, there's a variety of them, but one, one interesting one that I, that I find interesting is, uh, is it's, it's to take people into what is generally recognized as a tension pattern people have with their breathing, where their shoulder muscles and their neck muscles get all involved in it. Um, and so one, one of the interesting ways to work with, with habits that people don't know that they're doing is to take that habit and make them do it intentionally. So, you know, if you wanted to uh, imitate someone that had a really tense breathing pattern. You can just imitate you, me. <laughs> I don't think you're that bad, but we can do this together. So I'll demonstrate, right? And then we can do it together. So it would be to go to inhale and go like this. That's like the startle reflex, right? Yes, so, so let it go. All right, so that's, so we'll do that. But, but, but then we have the opportunity to, once we've turned that habit on, to see what it's like to turn it off, right? So, Try that again, take a deep breath and pick your shoulders way up. Now, hold your breath, but drop your shoulders. All the way. And a bit more. And relax. And now exhale. Do you see how like the relaxation had to come in yeah. stages? So, and by the way, there's a difference between releasing your shoulders and pulling them down. So watch me do it. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll do the whole thing. And just watch. And I exhale smoothly. Yeah. See how they just drop yeah. down. See, what you did is you kind of pulled them down. It's like the muscles that were pulling them up were still active. You just engage the other muscles to go in the other direction. So we're going to try and find that off switch. <laughs> right? So let's give that a try. So take a deep breath and hold your breath. And now just let them go. All the way. And relax. See how your arms were hovering? Yeah. It's so interesting. You can breathe now. Yeah. It still feels guilty. Yeah. Exactly, right? So you can work with that for quite a while before you actually figure out in your brain, wow, there's the off switch for those muscles. Yeah. One more time. We like to do things in threes. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to actually do it a little bit differently. Okay. Take a deep breath and pick your shoulders up. Now hold your breath and pick your shoulders a little higher. Good. A little higher. Good. Now, don't exhale, just let it all go. Fantastic. And now, breathe. Feel the difference? Yeah. I had to ramp up the tension a little bit more. Yeah. Until you noticed. So, yeah. So. It's slow. Yeah. <laughs> you only took three breaths to get it. <laughs> yeah. Some people struggle with that for quite a while. Some people actually find that they can't even hold their breath as they relax their shoulders. They'll go like this. And they'll leak. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the brain sort of not being able to sort out the difference between the breathing muscles and the shoulder muscles. So it's like, if, they're, if, if those shoulder tensing muscles are very deeply connected with the act of breathing, then relaxing the shoulder muscles forces you to want to let go of your breath. So there's a little sort of neurological sorting out that some people have to do, even yeah. to be able to hold their breath while their shoulders let go. Yeah. And that's very much in my practice at the moment, what I'm trying to work on. So oh, I that makes sense. Oh, yeah. I picked the perfect side. Yeah, you did. Well, there you <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you work on something called The Breathing Project, or you run The Breathing Project. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. The Breathing Project is an educational nonprofit that I founded uh, right at the beginning of uh, 2002. Um, and then about a year later, um, we opened a studio, which was also called The Breathing Project in New York City. Uh, and um, I was involved in uh, running and teaching at that studio for about 14 years, and we just closed uh, the studio part of the Breathing Project this past summer. Uh, it remains as an educational nonprofit, and we continue to do work uh, sponsoring special programs, uh, seminars. Uh, the next big event that we have coming up is uh, 
coming up actually uh, just before I come here. Yeah. Uh, in uh, on, so it's on uh, June twenty first of next year, twenty eighteen. We're doing a four day. day of yoga. It's an international day of yoga. Plus, it's T K V Desikachar's eightieth birthday, or would have been yeah. his eightieth birthday. My teacher who passed away a couple of years ago. And so we're gathering some of the uh, main students of his at uh, Kripalu, which is uh, in Massachusetts, north of New York, uh, for a four-day event there. So the Breathing Project is co-sponsoring and producing that with Kripalu. So that's the sort of thing we'll be doing going forward, now that we don't have to pay rent on that studio anymore. Yeah. And it was Deshra Kumar who changed all your thoughts on breath. He changed a lot of my thoughts on breathing. He, he actually messed up my breathing quite a bit when I first met him. But it was no fault of his, it was just that I'd never thought of doing the three-part breath from the top to the bottom. I'd always done it from the bottom to the top, and I really resisted that at first. But uh, when I finally tried it, it simultaneously showed me vastly uh, greater possibilities for what I could do with my breath, but it also messed me up because I had such a deeply ingrained habit leading up to that, yeah. having, having been teaching and practicing yoga for about nine years at that point. Um, it, it just... Uh, it, it, create, it created kind of a, a pranic um, uh, breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> it took me about six months to get over that breath. Yeah, it's easy to learn things, very hard to unlearn things. Exactly, yes. But Desi Char definitely revolutionized the way that um, I view so many things, and uh, on the most fundamental level, uh, philosophically. Because I, I uh, had started uh, with an organization called the Shibananda Organization, um, and they've had a center here in London for many yeah. years. Are they still Chepstow Villas? Is that where they are? It's, I think they may have moved. But anyway, it's, it's a worldwide organization that's responsible for training thousands and thousands of teachers over the years. And I trained with them in 1979 to be a teacher and went on to work as staff, full-time staff for that organization. In fact, I eventually became a, a Swami, which meant I wore orange and was doing the whole thing. And so I came very much out of that uh, sort of philosophical, fairly Hindu, religious kind of context in, in my training, in my understanding, and the way I was, uh, had come to teach. And Desikachar understood this about me when I met him. He understood I had come from that context. And so um, a lot of the work we did, uh, as much as the ideas about breathing and asana and individualizing asana and modifying it for therapeutic purposes was really at the heart of, of what he taught, when, when he and I were dealing with each other one-on-one, -on -one, it was much more on the sort of philosophical conceptual level that, that we were working in and trying to uh, get me to figure out what it was that I was sort of grounded in philosophically. Because his, his tradition is quite different than the one that I come from. And you have quite different philosophical views, don't you? Uh, from Desmond Char, even, yes. <laughs> from most people I knew, I yeah. have different philosophical views. But it's, it's something, at least as it pertains to the teaching of yoga, um, I've, done, I, I've done my very best to make sure that, that nothing comes out of my mouth in the way of teaching or principles that I can't back up objectively yep. from an anatomical, real-world principle. I, I've banished any appeal to mysticism or appeal to authority from the foundations of, of, what I, of what I teach, and that's been very important to me, to know that if someone asks why, that I can give them a response yeah. that I feel is grounded in reality. Um, take a break there. <laughs> <laughs> Quick edit while she goes through notes. Yeah. <laughs> Look, if we're doing an edit, you might as well hold them here yeah. where you can actually see them. So we've read that you think Svadhyaya is more important than alignment. Yeah, somehow I got misquoted somewhere in an article about this idea of Svadhyaya being more important than alignment. That's like saying that, you know, that, that truck lorries are more important than, than apples. It's, you know, I mean, I would never in the same sentence put those two as a choice of one being more important than the other. So somehow that got misquoted from something I said, which it wouldn't be the first time. But um, I think it would be useful in answering that question to just define a little bit what these terms are, right? So um, asana really is what most people equate with yoga these days. Because the, the aspect of yoga that has gained it 
worldwide popularity and worldwide attention and, and millions and millions of people practicing it is, is really more of the asana side of, of yoga. Um, as anyone that has studied the tradition at all will tell you, yoga as a topic is, is much more vast than just asana, although asana is the main avenue through which people approach these vast teachings of yoga. Uh, and the so-called traditionalists who may have some problems with the way yoga has been popularized and taught and, and, and in their view commercialized or colonialized or any of the other eyes that are negative about what has been done to yoga usually would, would be very quick to point out that um, yoga can't be reduced to asana. So I think what I must have been saying in whatever conversation ended up getting quoted, misquoted this way, was that what, what, what makes asana practice yoga is to bring the qualities, not just of swadhyaya, which is self-study or self-reflection, but to, to bring that quality of swadhyaya to bear on these, these really deep questions that arise when we're practicing asana. And, and some of the deepest questions revolve around are the limitations I'm experiencing when I attempt to do whatever, things that are going to change? Things about me that are changeable, or are they things that are not so changeable? Things that I have to surrender to. You know, if there's something about my body proportions that makes a certain asana or a certain movement, for example, like a jump through, difficult. Like if I have a long torso and short arms, jump throughs are gonna be hard because of my proportions. My proportions are not going to change. I have to surrender to this thing that's not gonna change, this thing about me that's not gonna change. If I wanna practice jump throughs, how do I surrender to it? I put blocks under my hands. You know, I do something to take that into account. I don't think that something fundamental about my body is gonna change this and make this easier. So that's the attitude of, of surrendering to something that you can't change, we could put under this general heading of Ishwara Pranidana, which is one of the components of of yoga practice according to the traditional philosophy. The other side of it though is there's plenty of things we run into that will change. Like this thing here that you do with your shoulders. That's, that's a nervous system thing. You identified in three breaths a pattern that you had. You, I helped you find the pattern and then you found a way to turn it off. That was something that changed quickly. Things that we can change fall under the heading of tapas in this definition of yoga, uh, or tapaha technically is what the word is. Now, the Swadhyaya component is the third element, so it's Tapas Swadhyaya Ishwara Pranayana, is how yoga practice is defined. And so, I think what was happening when I said something that I'm getting misquoted as Swadhyaya is more important than alignment, is that I was probably having a discussion of what makes an asana practice a yoga practice. It's when you bring to it this perspective of, of trying to introspect or bring this quality swadhyaya into what your experience is, helping you sort out the things that you can be changing from the things that you should be surrendering to. Now, alignment comes into this conversation uh, simply as this um, idea that when you're practicing asana, there is a way to hold your body so that the pathways of weight that are passing through your skeletal structure are clearest. So that the pathways of weight that are passing through your joints, which is where your bones meet each other, is balanced. Um, and this has been a, a very strong conversation in the last several years in the workshops I've been teaching, is, is having a conversation about alignment that honors the person, that honors the individual, such that we can understand that, it's, that, that asanas don't actually have alignment. People have alignment. But in order for a person to understand what the alignment is for them that's useful in an asana, requires swadhyaya. Requires them to introspect and understand what it feels like when the pathway that's passing through a joint is balanced as opposed to unbalanced. You know? So somehow that got reduced to swadhyaya is more important than alignment, but there you have more of the context of that. Thank you. Sure. And do you think it's very much uh, the role of the teacher to get the student to explore and do that self-inquiry? Perhaps that's yeah. what's more yeah. missing and the focus is more on 
telling students to do certain alignments rather than find the alignment that's right for you. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, actually. Because, um, yes, I would say the role of the teacher in this context is to engage the student in an inquiry about what's right for them, rather than make them dependent on the instructions that are coming out of the teacher's mouth with the thought that if I just do what the teacher says, I'll be safe. Yeah. Because in the end, you know, uh, a teacher can't keep their students safe. Uh, you, you can't force a student to be safe. We, I think many teachers have had this experience of not, not only from the teaching side, but of having been that student in the class. If you have someone in your class who's determined to hurt themselves, they'll find a way to do it, regardless of how great a teacher you are. You know, I have been that student. Most of the teachers I know have at one point or another been that student. So we just need to recognize that. The, the best we can hope for is to create a safe learning environment that's structured well enough so that the student has an opportunity to try something and then try something else and then notice what the difference is. And that's been my main teaching method um, for a while is try this, try that, see what you notice. Uh, so that the student can have their own experience. Yeah. Uh, rather than do this and you will feel that, isn't it wonderful? Which is sort of how a lot of alignment speak comes out yeah. in the teaching environment. I mean, I've definitely had a few classes where I've put myself in a pose that feels safe for my body. Mm -hmm. My teachers put me into the alignment version of the pose. Sure, because it looked better to them from the outside. Or it's what they were taught. Or it's what they were taught. Yeah, but a lot of it is just based on the aesthetics of what people recognize as what proper alignment looks like. And what it looks like from, from an outside observer is one thing. What it feels like to the person doing it is quite another. And it's a tricky thing because we, we've been trained to try to help people to be safer. But unless we can help themselves to be safer, you know, without us messing around with them, then we're only doing them a, a limited amount of, amount of good. And I've heard way too many stories about students being injured by that sort of thing. You know, a part of how I've been earning my living for the past 30 plus years is um, as a body worker. You know, working on people's bodies, helping people recover from yoga injuries. And I've heard way too many stories about someone who's been in class and had a teacher come over and do this or that adjustment and, and actually injured them in that, you know. Um, and uh, that's, uh, those are hard stories to hear, you know, uh, because people come to us to, to get some help and to get healthier. And, and you know, the, the, the tricky part of it is that the, the student very seldom delivers that feedback of what happened to the teacher. They'll tell me about it, perfectly willing to tell me about it. But when I ask them, did you tell the teacher, they most often say no. I was like, well, I know it's a difficult conversation to have, but they're gonna keep doing that to people unless they get that feedback. And now perhaps a slightly controversial question. We're currently going through um, a real period of time where the hot topic is about the abuse of power between predominantly male and women, but between people in a position of power, mm -hmm. um, similar to a guru sisha relationship. Mm -hmm. And we have seen there be some incidences, incidences in yoga where there's been an abuse of power. Some. Um, some, a number. <laughs> and so I just want to get your thoughts on this issue, yeah. particularly within yoga, um, yeah. and also how how people can deal with it if they have been through a situation like that. Sure, sure. Well, we alluded to this power dynamic uh, somewhat uh, when I mentioned this idea of people getting hurt in class and the student not telling the teacher, you know. Uh, and I, I'm well aware of the fact that when I'm, when I'm at the front of a room in charge, okay, um, I am quite easily made the recipient of whatever projections or issues people have ever had with whoever has been at the front of a room that they have occupied, whether it's a, a, a priest or a teacher or a professor or um, whoever, or a guru, right? And, and so we yoga teachers, I think, need to recognize that it's not just us in the room with our students. It's everyone who has ever been in a position of authority to a certain extent. Um, and so I think the, the, the bottom line for this for the yoga community is, is education. It's, it's 
it's knowing that these issues exist and these dynamics are there and I think part of every responsible teacher training program that, that uh, educates people how to be that person in the room needs to address these. Just You don't need to get an advanced degree in psychology and you don't need to make a big deal of it, but you need to at least recognize that this is a very significant part of what happens when we're in these rooms. And to let people know, yes, there are going to be moments when people are attracted to you, you know, um, and you're attracted to them. And what do you do? And, you know, people are working on all sorts of codes of ethics. There's been codes of ethics for yoga teachers for quite a while, actually. Uh, I know some of the people that, that developed them. And, you know, I was sort of part of some of those conversations that, uh, that gave rise to these things. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, it's just human nature, you know, that it's part of our upbringing. It's part of the fact that we have spent significant hours of our lives in rooms with people that have some authority over us, even if it's at, at work. You know, you get, most people have a boss of some kind, you know? Um, and all of this gets brought into a yoga room and then we pump prana into it. And it should not be surprising that some of these so-called scandals result from taking these dynamics and just energizing them. So rather than going into the specifics and, and all of that and what I think about the whole, you know, post-colonial yoga and deconstructing all these postmodern ideas about, about privilege and what it means to be a white male and all of that, you know, what I would say is that it's, it's really, these are important conversations to have. And my view is that it should turn into more conscious education for yoga teachers, whether they're male or female or whoever they are, uh, of what these dynamics are going to be. Because we're going to run into them. We're going to run into them. And it's very seductive. I mean, I have to say that I've been doing this since 1979. I have experienced all of this from every side of the equation. Um, I'm very, very happy that when I was a young yoga teacher, there was no such thing as the internet. <laughs> because sometimes you learn about these things by making mistakes. And I don't envy the, the young teachers now who who are coming up. I mean, on the one hand, people are building their careers on the internet. There's people who, who teach who have built their careers on Instagram and other web-based platforms, and it's a positive thing in that sense. But also, you make one bad step or one bad quote or one bad misquote about some of these topics that are hot-button topics, and your career can be over in a weekend. I've seen that happen, too. So. Uh, it's, these, are, I, these are topics that people are very activated about, very emotional about, and it speaks to the need for better uh, and more in-depth education for us as a yoga teaching community. And that's all I'm willing to say on camera. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And then the final question. Yeah. How do you see with, um, have we experienced more and more cases of anxiety, depression, mm. Um, happening within the world and for mm. me it feels like yoga is going to become more and more prevalent in people's lives. How do you see yoga changing or becoming more intensified within the lives of people over the next 10-20 years? Well I think we're going to see just much more of what we've been seeing and then some things probably that we don't expect. Um, you know, uh, what we've been seeing is everything in the world you can imagine having the word yoga attached to it, you know. Um, I mean, I thought we had reached some kind of pinnacle of this when Yoga Booty Ballet came out, you know, and that was a while ago. But since then, we've had um, uh, ganja yoga and beer yoga and drunk yoga and, and doga and broga and um, goat yoga and, you know, um, so we're going to keep seeing more and more of that. And I'm actually...
actually one of the few people who's had, who comes from this traditional background who thinks that's a good thing. Um, and the reason I think it's a good thing is that, first of all, it's a free market. This is an expression of what happens in a free market of ideas and commerce where something popular is being packaged in ways to reach m into more and more markets. And since I am fundamentally a, a, a free market person, um, I don't have a problem with that. I have emotional reactions to some of it. It's like, oh, seriously? Really? Really? You're going to attach the word yoga to this? But in, this, in almost the same moment, I take a breath and I go, okay. Is there going to be somebody who finds himself in a room on a mat with a teacher asking them to breathe and move and feel themselves in a new, unprecedented way that they would otherwise never have had access to, and the only reason they're there is because they could bring their dog with them, or they, they wanted to do it with a, with a goat in the room. I mean, these are, these are ways of reaching people who would otherwise not be reached. And, and having reached them and having gotten them on the mat and having given them some experience of their mind, body, breath that they've never had before, there's always the potential, the possibility to go deeper. And I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen in the history of the popularity of yoga. I have seen amazing, wonderful teachers who, whose work I truly respect, who came into it completely from the fitness side of it, who started off as aerobics teachers, and who were trained to teach yoga in a weekend workshop designed to turn yoga teachers, uh, uh, aerobics teachers into yoga teachers in the course of a weekend. You know? And there's a lot of people who would look at that and go, that's horrible. In fact, a lot of people looking at so that sort of thing as horrible were some of the people in the room with me when we came up with the 200 and 500 hour standards. Because it's like, we don't know necessarily how many hours are enough, but we, we're, we're damn sure a weekend isn't enough. Right? That was part of the conversation when we set the standards. So, you know, I've seen this thing cycling through, you know, and what, what's it going to look like in the future? Um, I think we're going to have um, virtual reality yoga. That's, we're right on the threshold of that. We're going to have um, uh, uh, rather expensive yoga clothing with, um, with sensors built into it that will cue us uh, about our breathing and our posture. And that'll be hooked into some kind of a web interface so that I can administer uh, hands-on adjustments from across the planet. This is, the technology is there. It's just no one has come up with a delivery platform for it yet that, that makes sense. But, you know, if someone had told me 10 years ago that I'd be making a chunk of my income from online courses that I recorded that people were signing up for in, how many countries is it? Like 40 countries or something? More than, more than 40. More than 40 countries, you know, um, uh, I, I wouldn't have thought it possible. So, who knows? But I, I say bring it all on. Make the yoga pie bigger and bigger and bigger. That way my tiny little slice gets more nourishing. That's the way I look at it. So. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much well, for thank your you. time. And we look forward to welcoming you, you to Tri Yoga next year. I look forward to being at Tri Yoga next year. Thank you.